Good evening, everyone. If you'd like to follow along tonight, we're going to be picking back up in our study of Psalms. In the middle of Psalm 35. Psalm 35. <clears throat> Last week we had been going through Psalm 35 and one of the things that we saw was that David was once again asking God for help, uh, specifically for deliverance from his enemies. And one of the things that we saw was that David was praying that his enemies would be brought to justice. So we talked about that a little bit. and. It seemed a little harsh at first, but then we dove a little bit deeper and we, caught, we saw what kinds of people these were. Uh, David started to explain how he had treated them, how he was like a brother or a friend to them in their time of need. But when the roles were reversed, they treated him maliciously. And so that's kind of where we left off was uh, right around verse 16, uh, as David was explaining the kind of treatment that he had received on their behalf. And so we're going to pick up tonight starting in verse 17. Psalm 35, verses 17 to 18. David says, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my soul from their ravages, my only life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great congregation. I will praise you among a mighty people. So what is David asking for here? I kind of put it up on the slide already, but what's David asking for? To be saved, right? To be saved, yeah. He's asking to be uh, rescued. And he says, how long will you look on, right? I don't think that David was asking for or looking for a specific answer there, but it's kind of a way to voice his suffering. Like, how long will this go on? You know, just as a, a way to express the frustration that he was feeling in dealing with this situation. And again, we've, we've talked about this before. This is uh, very similar to the things that Job was struggling with. And rather than coming off as disrespectful, this is, this is more a way of David pouring out his heart before God, expressing his thoughts and feelings to God, the things that he's struggling with that are on his mind, uh, as we're encouraged to do, as we're encouraged to bring our heart before God. And so that's kind of what he's doing here is, is giving voice to this suffering. He says, rescue my soul from their ravages. So he's asking for deliverance again. He says, my only life from the lions. My only life from the lions. David knows that he only has one opportunity here, right? And his, his foes are oppressive. What other foe do we have that's referenced as a lion? The devil, right? Satan, the, the accuser, right? That's an easy one. He has to be rescued from that. But notice here in verse 18, he says that he'll give God thanks in the great congregation. In other words, in the midst of a lot of people, David will give thanks. And he's going to praise God amongst a mighty people here. So is David sort of making a deal with God here? Look, God, if you do this, if you save me, then I'll praise you. Is that what he's doing? What do you think? Rick? You could, you could take it that way. I don't think of it that way. I feel like more like he's saying he's going to praise him. I can see how you could take it that way, but I, I don't think that's what he means. I believe he's just saying, I, we don't give you thanks regardless, you know. Yeah. Uh, Shirley, I think you had your hand up next. I, think, I take it that no matter what happens, he is still going to praise God. Yes. Okay. Matt? I was going to say, he's, he's looking forward to praising God. He's going yeah. to rescue me and then I'll praise him. Yeah. Think about the way that God makes his promises. When God says he's going to do something, it's a guarantee for you. Right? It's, it's, he's going to do this for you. And I think that this is what David is saying as well. It's not that, well, God, if you save me, I'm going to do this. It's more that he knows that God is a deliverer. 
He knows that God will rescue him when he cries out for help. And therefore he's saying, I'm going to do this. This is more of saying, this is a certainty. After you save me, I'm going to be expressing my thanks and everything to you. This is what I'm going to be doing, right? Sometimes, and this is a trap that everyone can fall into, we kind of do this deal making with God, right? Well, if you get me out of this tough situation, I'll go and do this or whatever it may be, you know. Uh, that could be anything from, well, you know, God, if you rescue me this one time, then I'll get baptized. Or it might be, God, if you uh, help me through this, this hard thing, I'll give this much money to charity or whatever, whatever deal it is. Sometimes people think that way, right? Pat? Yeah. And he was rescued, he was rescued. Right, exactly. And that, that kind of goes along with what we do today, right? When, when we are baptized and we're thankful for God for, for helping us and delivering us, it's not just that's the end of it, and then we stop, right? The next step for us is we spread the gospel. We spread that good news. I was helped, you can be too, right? So that, that kind of ties into the same kind of attitude that David has there is the attitude that we see expressed in the New Testament as well. Okay. So the next couple verses here. Verse 19 down to 21. It says, Do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me, nor let those who hate me for no reason wink maliciously. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful words against those who are quiet in the land. They open their mouth wide against me and they say, Aha, our eyes have seen it. So David kind of going back again and, and once again describing some of his affliction, some of the suffering that he's going through, some of the people that he's, uh, he's dealing with. Now, we're not supposed to have repetitive prayers, Right? Didn't David just cover this? Didn't he just talk about the people that were bothering him? Why is he saying it again? Matt? We're not to have vain repetition, but we should. There are a lot of times we do need to repeat our prayers. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that we've seen from studying some of these more uh, poetic books is that repetition was their cultural way for emphasis. Right? So, the more you felt passionately about something, the more you would repeat it to emphasize it. So David expressing this here kind of shows you just how difficult of a time this was for him by the fact that he's repeating it. Rick? Yeah, too, a lot of these are songs. So they, songs and songs, often yeah. we repeat. And it was an old thing of thirst too that they would repeat something to uh, stress it. Make, yeah. Make it more important. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. And you can see just comparing uh, the the people versus their victims here. You know, David says in verse 19, don't let those who are wrongfully my enemies, right? He's showing that he's innocent, that there's, there's, no, there's nothing that uh, they should have against him, right? Those who hate me for no reason, you know? So David is kind of stressing how these people are that they don't really have any cause to be, uh, to be against him. And they says that they do not speak peace. And he contrasts that against those who are quiet in the land, otherwise those who are peaceful, right? And so he's describing these people again to God. Not that God doesn't know this already, but you know, it's just, again, there's a lot of emotion here that David is expressing. Now, verse 22, David says, You have seen it, Lord. Do not keep silent. Lord, do not be far from me. This verse is interesting because David says the word Lord two times, but are those two times different? What do you think, Matt? My translation says, You have seen it, O Yahweh. Well, your translation gave it away then, right? He's, uh, he's saying Yahweh, exactly. And so, you know, we, we often have 
the all caps Lord, and that's the placeholder for it, for, for Yahweh. And so, yeah, so Lord is a placeholder for God's personal name, right? But then the second time he says Lord, that's a title, right? That's, that's a way of addressing God as his position above David by calling him Lord. And so what's the significance then of David using these two terms for God? Calling God by his personal name and then by his title. What do you think? Well, he's he's uh, using his personal name, addressing him very specifically. And I think there's a relation to the covenant that using that name, but then also recognizing him as his Lord, as his master. And, and so that relationship that he has as his master, I, I'm your servant. Yeah. So that's exactly right. It's David is, isn't just pleading as God's servant. He's also pleading on a personal level, right? God is, God is his friend. God is someone who he knows personally and cares about personally. But he's also, David is also God's servant, right? There's a, a master-servant relationship there. So David is being respectful and being personal at the same time, right? He's pleading this uh, in both ways. And then verses 23 and 24 David says, stir yourself and awake to my right and to my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, Lord my God, according to your righteousness and do not let them rejoice over me. So again, David addresses God in two ways. So verse 23, what are those? Well, verse 23 is the lowercase. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. In 24, he uses the all caps again to signify right. his name, which is, you know, Yeah. So it's neat that in verses 22, 23, and 24, in each one of those, David is addressing God in two different titles. So three times, he addresses God two different ways, right? And so, again, when we're thinking of you know, the poetic nature of the Psalms and how a lot of these are sung, that might, that might have sounded even better in song when it was done. Uh, but it also, again, emphasizes God, or, uh, David's relationship with God. Any other thoughts or comments on that part before we move on? Kim? Yeah. So going back to, I guess, 17. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'm tired of waiting. And how do we balance that with the verses that tell us, the Psalms that tell us to wait on them? I think that's a great question. So if you didn't hear what Kim was saying, she was asking back up in verse 17, when David says, how long will you look on? David's obviously impatient, right? But we're also told elsewhere in the Bible that we should be patient and long-suffering as God is. And so how do we balance those two things? Because we get impatient as well. And I think that it's kind of like when we get angry, right? Anger is an emotion that we feel. But it's how do we act on that when we feel it, right? It's, there's nothing wrong with feeling sad or happy or angry or frustrated. Those are all just human emotions. It's what you do when you feel your emotions that matters, right? We don't tend to think of happy as a bad emotion. But it could be, right? If you're just so happy and you just decide, you know what, I'm really happy today and I'm going to go do whatever I want because I'm having such a great day. Maybe I'm going to blow all my money on something I don't need to, right? You know, you could do that and you could have a huge party, you know, and you could wake up three days later with the worst hangover you've ever had because you were just having such a good time. 
that's a way that you could take happy as an emotion and use it wrong, right? We tend to think of things like anger as the, the emotions that we've got to watch out for, but really any of our emotions can be a problem. The way that we're supposed to use these is by going to God in prayer with everything, right? We're encouraged to go to God with all of these things. God already knows what we feel. He already is aware of that, so us going to him and telling him about these things, it kind of helps us to think through maybe what we should be doing. One of the great examples that comes to my mind is, uh, is Cain. Cain and Abel, right? What happened with Cain? What happened with the sacrifices, right? He was making the wrong sacrifice, and he got upset, didn't he? But what was God's advice to him? He asked him why his countenance was fallen, right? And he said, if you do right, won't, won't you be okay? You know, and so he said, but if you don't, sin waits at your doorstep, right? It wasn't that it was bad that Cain got frustrated and upset. It was how did he act on that emotion that would either make things better or make things worse? Now, we know how that turned out for Cain. But for David here, David goes to God in prayer. And instead, he finds solace in that. Any thoughts, Matt? Lord, how long, you know, I'm, I'm in Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a formulaic lament to ask how long, but, sure. but it can seem it's like, I'm not waiting. <laughs> Even the verses were down at verse 23, you know, David can be seen to be telling God what to do, you know, stir up yourself, oh, wake, wake up! Yeah. And, and why are we telling God what to do? Of course, when we're giving quote-unquote commands to God, the requests, of course. Sure. But um, I think part of the idea about waiting on the Lord versus in these prayers, I I think lack of waiting on the Lord would be to just check out. It's like I'm not, I'm not doing Psalm 35. Right. I'm just God's not listening, and so I'm just forget it. I'm not even going to address Him. Yeah. I think we have failed to wait on the Lord then, and we've succeeded if we're actually addressing Him in prayers like that. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts, Rick? Uh, I think too we we have to we have to keep praying, but we also have to be patient and understand that our timing. Just like in David's case here, I don't know for sure what's mm -hmm. going on, but our timing is not always God's timing. And God, right. God will take care of things. It just may not be in the way you think or when you think. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll, it'll happen. It's just you, you do have to practice that patience. It's not easy. Absolutely. Kim? It reminds me of what Sarah did with Hagar. She got tired of waiting. Right, yeah. God said, we're going to have a baby. We're not having a baby. Yeah. Right. Take my servant. Yep. And then that, that led to a whole mess of problems, right? So, yeah, exactly. When we get tired of waiting, we think, well, I'll fix it. I can take care of this. Exactly. Exactly. Those are all good thoughts. Any other questions, comments there? Okay. So then, uh, in verse, one more comment on verse 24. David says, Judge me, Lord my God, according to your righteousness, and do not let them rejoice over me. So this is something we've touched on a couple times before, but we see here again that David invites judgment on himself. He says, Judge me, Lord. And again, that's probably not a request that we tend to make too often. So how might we learn from David's confidence in inviting judgment? Rick? Um, now, mine, weirdly enough, says vindicate me, which would, be, would mean, you know, kind of clear, sure. clear my name. Um, but when I look over at, like you're saying, judge me, when I look over at the Amplified, it does say judge me. And that's like, he's saying he's innocent all through here, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying these people don't have a reason. And then he's saying judge me or maybe vindicate me, but let me know if I'm yeah. wrong, kind of. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, if I'm wrong, let me know, but otherwise, you know. Yeah. Matt? Sometimes we use the word judge to mean condemn, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means, right. you know, right. weigh this out and right. remind me to be, you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. Kim? I think David kind of knew that God tests and tries us. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think here... It can be maybe uh, scary or frightening to 
to be asking God to take a closer look at you, right? Because that's what David is saying here is, you know, I feel that I'm right. You know, God, you look and you tell me. And again, it, it can be maybe a little bit scary to, and to say, God, take a closer look at my life and, and judge with scrutiny. But it's not like God doesn't know it already. And here, if David feels confident enough to ask for God to do that, he, he very clearly feels like he's following what he should be doing, right? When we, when we think about, you know, removing the splinter from our neighbor's eyes, right? We're first told to examine ourselves, right? So if you have examined yourself, if you, if you know that to the best of your knowledge, you're in the right, then you should feel confident in, in being able to invite God to take that very close look at you, Rick? talking about it in this sense mm -hmm. he's, he's, we're, we're asking God to judge us in a way as in let me know what I've got wrong that's actually yeah. a good thing it's a great that's thing that's a yeah. great thing to do right go to God and say let me know where I'm wrong tell me where I'm wrong let yeah. me correct me you know yeah and I mean honestly the, the, the best case here is that if, if you did have something wrong and you're going to God that he can point it out to you so you can correct it right what good would it be if you had a flaw and no one told you about it. Well, if there's a flaw that you don't know about, you can't fix it, right? So God could steer David right here if he was in fact in the wrong. Uh, Matt? Of course, in this context, he has all these enemies that are wrongfully, yeah. you know, all this stuff. So I think he feels in the right. So vindicate is probably a really good Sure, absolutely. Kim? Job, he says, hey, I'm blameless. I didn't do anything wrong. And Sarah's like, yeah, you did. Right. Right, absolutely. Okay, so the, the next few verses here, actually the last three verses, David says in verse 26, May those be ashamed and altogether humiliated who rejoice at my distress. May those who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and dishonor. May those shout for joy and rejoice who take delight in my vindication. And may they say continually, the Lord be exalted, who delights in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall, pro shall proclaim your righteousness and your praise all day long. So again, David asked for his enemies to be ashamed and humiliated as he did earlier in the psalm. We kind of already talked about that idea. But notice what he does in the, uh, in the second half of verse 27. In contrast to the prayer for his enemies, he asks a prayer for those who support him. He asks that they shout for joy and that they rejoice and that they say what? Matt? Yahweh be magnified. Yeah. That, the, the, that Yahweh be exalted, that the Lord be magnified, right? And notice it says that they say that continually, right? So David's prayer for those that support him is, first of all, joy, right? That they shout for joy and rejoice, that they have reason for joy. And second, and it might sound a little odd maybe, but his prayer for them is that they continually exalt the Lord. When you pray for someone, what do you pray for for them, right? Someone that you want to bless, right? Someone that you want to have good things happen to them. Maybe you say, I hope that they get well, right? Or I hope that they have a good day. Or they ho I hope that their kindness is returned to them or something like that. But David adds this part about, and I hope that they praise God, right? Which is a really good thing because it means that David is once again thinking about God getting the glory rather than himself. Because if you take a step back and remember the situation that's going on, it's that David is beset by enemies, right? And if David is the king, then his enemies are likely the enemies of the people as well. So if they're defeated, then that's a good thing for David but it would be easy for the people to praise David. Oh, you know, great for you, David. You've conquered your enemies. You're such a good king, right? They could do that. 
But instead, he prays that they don't lose sight of what's important, which is giving God the glory. And that means that if God's getting the glory, David's not getting the credit, which is good. So David is praying that people kind of keep their eyes on what's important. And that's a good prayer to have for people, right? And then, of course, at the very end, he says that he himself will also praise God, that he will praise him all day long, which is another way of saying continually. And most likely that's in the midst of that big assembly like he was talking about earlier in the psalm. Any other closing thoughts or comments or questions for Psalm 35? Okay. So we have some time to jump into Psalm 36 now. And Psalm 36 is a little bit of a shorter psalm again. Not all these psalms are super long. Psalm 36, starting in verse 1, it says, For the music director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, David starts off by saying, Wrongdoing speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. And so according to David, in this first verse of Psalm 36, where does wrongdoing start? In the heart right? It says it starts in the heart, which is interesting because we see that echoed elsewhere too, right? Maybe your mind goes to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 15, if you want to turn over there for just a moment. Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 15 verses 18 to 19. Jesus says, but the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart and those things defile the person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, acts of adultery, and other immoral sexual acts, thefts, false testimonies, and slanderous statements. So the heart is where wrongdoing starts, right? Bad thoughts start there, and when you act on them, now you've fallen into sin, right? So that's what David says. And David's thoughts are, again, reinforced there by Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. Something for us to be aware of, and it kind of echoes back to what David was talking about in the earlier psalm as well. But he also goes on, and David's talking about, uh, here, talking about the ungodly. He says there's another characteristic that they have. What is that? What is the other characteristic of the ungodly in the second half of that verse? They have no fear of God before their eyes. Why would that matter, do you think? Right? What is the fear of God? The beginning of wisdom. Right. So in other words, if you don't have the fear of God, you have no wisdom. Right? You're a fool, essentially. Right? You're foolish. You're foolish to not have the fear of God. That's right. And so David is starting to, once again, talk about this, this person who does wrong. They have wicked thoughts. Uh, they, they, they proceed out of their heart. There's no fear of God before them. So he's painting this, this rough picture here already with just one verse. But then it gets worse. In verse 2, David says, For it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his wrongful deed and the hatred of it. Now, what does that mean? I, I know if you compare the different translations, they're all word that a little bit different. And in my opinion, they can kind of be confusing when you compare them next to each other. So what is that verse getting at, if you paraphrase it? Rachel? Um, the English Standard Version says, For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. He has a very smug, arrogant, like, I'm never going to get found out. Yeah. Yeah, essentially, this, the fact that he's done wrong, he's flattered by this because I'm so clever. No one's ever going to find out about this, right? Or you could look at it in another sense. Um, I think some of the other translations almost put it as he's flattered by the wrong things that he does. He's proud 
of the wrong things that he does. Either way, it's not good, right? You shouldn't be proud or smug about wrongdoing in any event, right? Matt, did you have your hand up? I was just thinking that it reminds me of the, the church in Corinth that there was a yeah. guy that had his father's wife, whatever in the world that was about. And yeah. Instead of mourning and you know, as a church being sad and trying to correct that, they were they were happy and yeah. somehow flattered by that. You know, like yeah, exactly. So not good, right? This this person who has no fear of God, who has these this wrongdoing in their heart, who's flattered by this, uh, which is not good. That's his heart. How are his words? His words there in verse three it says, "The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good." So his words are even worse. Right? Remember what Jesus said back in Matthew 15. Right? Those words that are coming out of your mouth are, are coming out of your heart. And so we see that happening. Those thoughts of wrongdoing that are in this ungodly person's heart are leading to wickedness and deceit coming out of them. And of course, if they have no fear of God, then certainly they've ceased to be wise. Right? So this is just this, this picture that David's painting of this person of iniquity. He says in verse 4, he plans wickedness on his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not reject evil. So he plans wickedness on his bed. What what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. Ruminating on it. He's growing it within him. So. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, that he's ruminating on it, right? Like when you go when you go to bed at night, I don't know what you think about. Maybe you're thinking about the things that you might have to do for the next day that are coming up, you know, like, well tomorrow hopefully I'll be able to go and get the groceries and, and I want to make sure that I do this and I want to make sure I do that or or whatever it is. You're kinda running through your plan for the following day and did did I get that you get this set out for the next day, and maybe you're doing that. You're thinking through your plans. This guy's also thinking through his plans. It's just that his plans are bad. They're not good, right? He's, he's meditating on wickedness, and he's set himself on a path that is not good. So he, at a time when other people are maybe relaxing before they go to bed, he's planning wickedness, right? It's just, it's, it's a part of everything that he does, and he does not reject evil. So that's, that's a, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It just reminds me of King Ahab when he yeah. was uh, coveting Naboth's vineyard. Yeah, absolutely. Ahab's a great example of someone who would fit this, right? And maybe Jezebel too, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a terrible person that David's painting a picture of. You might wonder, well, so far David hasn't requested anything from God, right? He hasn't praised God yet in this psalm. He's not thanking God for anything yet. He's just talking about a really bad guy. I wonder where he's going with this, right? So let's find out then. Verse 5. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Before we go ahead, uh, at least in my translation, I think different ones say it differently, but verse 1, transgression declares to the ungodly. It's, like, it's almost like almost like how in Proverbs there's Lady Wisdom saying things. It's like oh, transgression yeah. is personified and all of this bad stuff we just read about is sort of like <laughs> the advice of transgression. As yeah, you know. the opposite of yeah. the Lady of Wisdom, yeah, right? Like Satan or the devil. Yeah. Giving this advice. No, thank you. That's that's good. I haven't seen that translation Maybe yet. King James doesn't word it quite that way. That's good. So yeah, in verse 5, David finally mentions something that maybe we can relate to here. He says in verse 5, Your mercy, Lord extends to the heavens your faithfulness reaches to the skies you just switch gears on me without warning right those two don't seem to tie it all together he's talking about a really bad person and now he just stops leaves that alone and now he's praising god like normal what in the world right and guess what you won't be able to find out till next week because we're out of time so we're going to stop there so think about that 
that's going to be what we're going to start off with next week is trying to figure out why did David make such a harsh transition? Why did he go from talking about this person of iniquity to praising God? So thank you, everyone. In just a moment, we'll be singing that invitation song, 322. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about rulers of our nation, right? That's something that's probably on a lot of people's minds because it's an election year and it's all over the news. When you turn on the news, you hear about the upcoming election. And we know we're just going to keep seeing more and more and more of that as we get closer to that date. And if I had to hazard a guess, I would say that all of you at some point over the past eight years have been disappointed in a world leader at least once, right? If anybody has not, then tell me what news you're following because it sounds pretty great. But I think everyone here, regardless of what party you vote for or what other political beliefs that you have, you've probably didn't been disappointed in a world ruler, an American ruler at some point as well, right? That's the day-to-day -day reality that we have. And that's going to just keep coming to the front, to the forefront of our mind, the closer we get to our election season. But if you look at the writings of Paul, you'll notice that Paul often addresses Jesus as Lord Jesus, right? Paul says that many, many times. I didn't count. There's, there's so many times. But he addresses God, or he addresses Jesus as Lord Jesus. That's how Paul often addresses him. One that I like the most here was uh, in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy verse one, or chapter 1, verse 17, he says, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, be glory, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul addressed Jesus as Lord Jesus so many times. And we know, in fact, that Jesus is a king. If you turn over to John chapter 18, John chapter 18 and verse 17, it reads, oh, I picked the wrong verse. I got that mixed up. Well, the verse I'm thinking of is when he's standing before Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you a king? And he says, you say correctly that I am a king, right? 18, Was I just too far up? 1837. 37. 37, not 17. I can't read my own handwriting. Yeah, thank you. It says, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So Jesus himself declares that he is in fact a king. Right? When we think about that, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know he's a ruler. And oftentimes you might hear people say that, you know, Jesus is king of my life. And all of that sounds really wonderful, right? Jesus should be king of our life. But you might be thinking, okay, well, that's, that's great that Jesus is king of my life and, and Jesus has a good example and I follow that example. But in a practical matter, how does that help me on a day-to-day? -day? Because when I think about the world rulers and the anxiety that that causes me or the frustration that that causes me or whatever, it's, it's not like Jesus is going to go run for office, right? That's not how it is. So how, how do we take that as a practical application and help us out? Well, if we think about Paul as an example and the fact that he talked about Jesus being his king, that Jesus is Lord, he wasn't just saying that as, as a nice way to praise God, but he truly meant it, that Jesus is his Lord. Jesus was his king. For us, that means following Jesus' teachings on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That will ultimately lead to a better place that we live in. Think about how that works. When Paul would go to these different churches, he would pass along the teachings of Jesus, his king. 
Those teachings showed people a better way to live. From there, they took those teachings and incorporated them into their lives, improving their lives, and then spreading that to others. And so it kind of ripples outward. As they see how those teachings can help, as they follow them, it expands, and it creates a better and a better and a better place. So Jesus' teachings helped him. <clears throat> Not only that, but Jesus is worthy of that obedience, right? The fact that he went and was willing to die on the cross, a lot of times we might want world leaders to be accountable, right? We, we look towards a problem in, in our country and, and we want to blame somebody, right, for whatever the problem is, whether it's an economy or a law or something else. And look at what Jesus did. Jesus accepted the consequences of everyone. He bore those and he dealt with those so that we would be saved. So all of this Jesus has already done for us on a spiritual level, but it has real world application as well. When we go out there, no, Jesus won't be on the ballot. We can't vote for Jesus in an upcoming election. You can write him in, but that's not going to do anything for you, right? But regardless of whatever candidate you end up voting for in the coming weeks and months, you know, when, when you get there, whatever you do is not going to change where Jesus is at. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Other terms will start and end, but Jesus' won't. And what that means is that he is constantly ruling. World leaders can only go so far as God permits them to go. Their authority only exists because God allows it to exist, which means you can vote with your conscience in whatever way you deem to be the best in, in compliance with Scripture, and then you can rest easy. Because at the end of the day, you know that Jesus is your king and that Jesus is in charge. And if Jesus was willing to go to the cross to suffer consequences for you that he had no part in causing, then you know that he's going to watch over you. All of these psalms that we've been reading have been about how God is a deliverer, a redeemer, a refuge. And so this is a time for us to put that trust in God and show that. And what this means is you get to sleep easier at night is the practical application. Because knowing that God is in charge, that Jesus is king, means you can bring your prayers before him like David and leave your anxieties and your worries there. So I would encourage you as we get closer to that season, not to let all that anxiety and worry and everything eat you up. But instead I'd encourage you to pray to God Remember that Jesus is king and to lay those anxieties before him and let them be. Leave them there and trust that God will lead you to a better place. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and King, you have that opportunity tonight. Or if you need to ask for prayers from the congregation or anything else that you might need, we're here to help you. And won't you let it be known while together, while we stand and while we sing. <clears throat>